<laughs> this is funny. Why are we all over here? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait and see. Hi. <laughs> I see Techo Su. Yes, hi. Oh, I know what's going on. I, I headphone my headphones in. And now can you hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So let's see, there must be some other people coming, I think. We're going to be talking about the, um, we have some, um, uh, let's see, shall I wear a scary glasses or shall, this one makes me look like the Lone Ranger. I don't know. <laughs> And then this one, this one is okay. I mean, yeah, but they keep falling off, but we'll leave this one on. This is okay. Okay. I'm sure some other people are showing up. We're early. So how are you doing, Bunty? You okay? He's going, you know, Bundy's going to go silent on us for two or three weeks. <laughs> We're trying to protect him and let him have some long sitting <laughs> without anybody knocking at his door. So he's, he might try it at the temple where he is, but I tried to find a place where he could run away and, and um, to uh, a little place in Sri Lanka where nobody would bother him. It will happen. He'll make a decision. You doing okay? Yeah? <laughs> oh, good, good. So I want to wait until um, 6.30 and then we'll see who else comes. We'll start at about 6.33 or something like that. <laughs> A great number. <laughs> okay, let me go over here for a minute. I'm not sure what the ringing means. We have um, I think Newton is helping us 
tonight. Okay, so we have four. Let's see if we can expand these out. I'm not sure how we do that. That's it, huh? Okay. Oh, there we go. We have some folks here. I just didn't know you were there. <laughs> we're having fun with the board tonight. I don't know what this is peeping at me for. Uh oh, am I in trouble or not? One minute. Uh, let's see here. What did I do? Okay, I'm going to start the class because I need to um, be sure that I, I think I doubled over on myself for a meeting tonight. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever made a mistake like that, but I might have to uh, jump out. So what I'm going to do is start now. So let us start with the Namotasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So here we are talking about the characters again in the story of the Buddha in his life. And we're going to talk about Visaka tonight, who was a big supporter for him. And Take a look. We're going to start with Visaka and then do Jivaka, and then we'll see what time we have left. So, Visaka was the devout and generous daughter of a millionaire, Dananjaya. Her mother was Sumana Dewi, and her beloved grandfather was a millionaire, Mangdaka. And when she was only seven years old, the Buddha happened to visit her birthplace, Badia, in the kingdom of Anga. Her grandfather, hearing of the Buddha's visit, he said to her, Dear girl, this is a happy day for you and a happy day for me. Summon the 500 maidens who are your attendants. Mount 500 chariots and accompanied by your 500 slave maidens, go forth to welcome the Buddha. My goodness. And I used to worry about just getting one house clean. <laughs> this was quite a household. <laughs> Readily, she agreed and as advised, went up to the Buddha, saluted him and sat respectfully at one side. And the Buddha was pleased with her refined manners and he preached the Dhamma to her and to others. 
though she was young in her age, she was comparatively far advanced for a, from any moral standpoint. As such, immediately after hearing the Dhamma, she attained the first stage of sainthood, Sotapati. In her early age, at seven, wow. Books state for us that even in the prime of her youth, she possessed masculine strength and was gifted with all the womanly charms. Her hair was like a peacock's tail, and when loosened, it reached the hem of her skirt, and then the ends of the hairs curled and turned upwards. Her lips were of a bright red color, were smooth and soft to the touch. Her teeth, they were white and were evenly set within interstices and shone like a row of diamonds. Her skin, without the use of any cosmetic, was as smooth as a blue lotus wreath and was of a golden color. She retained her youthful appearance, although she bore several children. Endowed with these five kinds of feminine beauty, hair and flesh, bone and skin and youth, young Wisaka excelled both in worldly wisdom and in spiritual insight. When she was about 15 or 16 years old, on a certain festival day, she went on foot with her retinue in a holiday spirit to the river to bathe. And suddenly there arose an unexpected shower and all but young Wisaka ungraciously ran as fast as they could and entered a hall where there were some Brahmins who had come in search of a suitable maiden possessed of the five kinds of beauty for their young master. Cultured Visaka, without any particular haste, gracefully proceeded at her usual gait, and she entered the hall with garments and ornaments all wet. The inquisitive Brahmins criticized her for not quickening up her pace as the others had done, and thus escaping being drenched in the rain. Talented Wisaka rose to the occasion and she gave an extempore discourse on the deportment according to her view. She said that she could have run even faster, but she refrained from doing so purposefully. And then she explained that it was not becoming for a king adorned with all jewels to gird up his loins and run in the palace court. Likewise, it is not becoming for a fully ca ca caparisoned state elephant to run, and it should move about with the natural grace of an elephant. Monks also incur criticism when they run about as ordinary laymen would, Likewise, it is not dignified as a spectacle to see a woman running about like a man. Brahmins were pleased with her instructive talk and thought that she was an ideal wife for their master. Accordingly, arrangements were made to give her in a marriage to their master. Punya Vadyana himself was the son of a millionaire named Megara, who was not a follower of the Buddha. Now, the marriage festival was conducted on an elaborate scale. On the wedding day, in addition to a large dowry 
and an exquisitely rich ornament. Mahala Tapila Andrana, her wise father, he gave her the following admonitions before she began the event. Number one, do not carry outside the indoor fire. Number two, do not take inside the outdoor fire. Number three, give only to those that give. Number four, do not give to those that do not give. Number five, give both to those that give and do not give. Six, sit happily. Seven, eat happily. Eight, sleep happily. Nine, tend the fire. Ten, honor the household divinities. Their implied meaning is as follows. Number one, the wife should not speak ill of her husband and parents-in-law to others, and neither should their shortcomings nor household quarrels be reported elsewhere outside the house. Number two, a wife should not listen to the reports and stories of other households. Number three, things should be lent to those who do not return who those I'm sorry things should be lent to those who do return them many times we lend the hammer or the screwdriver and we never see it again <laughs> we all do this today that's what she's talking he's talking about number four no article should be lent to those who do not return them number five Poor kinsfolk and friends should be helped even if they do not repay you. Six, a wife should sit in a becoming way. On seeing her parents-in-law or her husband, she should keep standing and not sit. Number seven, before partaking of her meals, a wife should first see that her parents-in-law and husband are served. She should also see that her servants are well cared for. Number eight, before sleep, a wife should see that all doors are closed, furniture is safe, servants have performed their duties, and parents-in-laws have re retired for the night. And as a rule, a wife should rise early in the morning, and unless unwell, she should not sleep during the day. Number nine, parents-in-law and husband should be regarded as fire. One should deal very carefully with them as they would deal with fire. Number 10, parents-in-law and husband should be regarded as divinities. It is, not note, it is noteworthy that the Buddha himself refers to parents-in-law as divinities, the Sasudeva. On the day she arrived at Insawati, the city of her husband, she was showered with various presents that were sent from people of all ranks according to their status and their ability. But so kind and generous was she that she distributed them amongst the donors themselves with a kind message and treated all of the residents of the city as if they were her own kinfolk. By this noble gesture, on the first day, she came to her husband's home. She became endeared by all of the people in the city. 
Now, there is an incident in her life which reveals her dutiful kindness, even towards animals, that is remembered. Hearing that her well-bred mare gave birth to a foal in the middle of the night, immediately she repaired to the stable with her female attendants bearing torches in their hands and she attended to all of the mayor's needs with the greatest care and attention until the foal was born. As her father-in-law was a staunch follower of Nagantha Nataputa, he invited a large number of naked ascetics to his house for alms. On their arrival, Wisaka was requested to come and render homage to these so-called arahants. She was delighted to hear the word arahant and hurried to the hall, only to see naked ascetics devoid of all modesty. The sight was too unbearable for a refined lady like Visaka. She reproached her father-in-law and retired to her quarters without entertaining them. The naked ascetics took offense and found fault with the millionaire for having brought a female follower to the ascetic, Godama, to his house. They asked him to expel her from the house immediately. But the millionaire pacified them. And one day he sat on a costly seat and began to eat some sweet porridge rice from a golden bowl. At that moment, a bhikkhu he entered the house for alms. Wisaka was fanning her father-in-law and without informing him of his presence, she moved aside so that he might see him. Although he saw him, he continued eating as if he had not seen him in the doorway. Wisaka politely told the bhikkhu, pass on, venerable sir, my father-in-law is eating stale fare, Puranam. The ignorant millionaire, misconstruing her words, was so provoked that he ordered the bowl to be removed and Wisaka to be expelled from the house. Wisaka was the favorite of all the inmates of the house, and nobody dared to touch her. But Wisaka, disciplined as she was, she would not accept without protest such treatment even from her father-in-law. She politely said, Father, this is, this is no sufficient reason why I should leave your house. I was not brought here by you like a slave girl from some ford. Daughters whose parents are alive do not leave like this. It is for this very reason that my father, when I set out to come here, he summoned eight clansmen and entrusted me to them saying carefully, if there be any fault in my daughter, investigate it. Send word to them now and let them investigate my guilt or my innocence. Well, the millionaire agreed to her reasonable proposal and summoning them said, at a time of festivity, while I was sitting and eating sweet milk, rich porridge from a golden bowl, this girl said that I was eating what was unclean. You should convict her of this fault and expel her from my house. Wisaka proved her innocence by stating, that is not precisely what I said. When a certain bhikkhu was standing at the doorway for alms, my father-in-law was eating sweet milk rice porridge ignoring him, thinking to myself that my father, without performing any good deed in this life, is only consuming the merits of past deeds, I told the bhikkhu. 
Pass on, venerable sir. My father-in-law is eating stale fare. What fault of mine is there in this? She was acquitted of the charge. And the father-in-law himself agreed. She was not guilty. But the spiteful millionaire charged her again for having gone behind the house with male and female attendants in the middle watch of the night when she explained that she actually did so in order to attend on a mayor in travail. The clansmen remarked that their noble daughter had done an exemplary act which even a slave girl would not do. She was thus acquitted of the second charge too. But the vengeful millionaire would not rest until she was found guilty. Next time he found fault with her for no wrong of hers at all. He said that before her departure from home, her father gave her 10 admonitions. For instance, he said to her, the indoor fire is not to be taken out of doors. Is it really possible to live without giving fire even to your neighbors? On both sides of us, questioned the millionaire. She availed herself of the opportunity to explain all of the 10 admit admonitions in detail to his entire satisfaction. The millionaire was silenced and he had no other charges to make. Having proved her innocence, self-respecting Wisaka now desired to leave the house as she was ordered to do so at first. The millionaire's attitude towards Wisaka was completely changed and he was compelled to seek a pardon from her, his daughter-in-law for what he had uttered through ignorance, forbearing Visaka in accordance with her true Buddhist spirit, granted him a pardon on condition that he would give complete freedom to her to carry out her religious activities as she so desired. Her father-in-law readily agreed to this and granted her full freedom to perform her religious activities. Now, Visaka, she lost no time in inviting the Buddha to the house for alms. The Buddha came and had his meal. After the meal was over, the Buddha expounded a sermon. The millionaire sat behind a curtain and he listened to the sermon. At the end of that discourse, he became Sotapanna and acknowledged his boundless gratitude to his daughter-in-law for having initiated him into the true path of deliverance and emotionally remarked that he would hereafter regard her, Visaka, as his mother. Later on, when she bore a son, she called him Magara. And on the following day, the Buddha visited her. And on that occasion, her mother-in-law heard the Dhamma and she became a Sotapanna too, a stream enterer. By her tact, wisdom, and patience, she gradually succeeded in converting her husband's household to a happy Buddhist home. Daily Visaka used to give alms to the Sangha at her own house, both in the forenoon and afternoon. She used to visit the monastery to minister to the needs of the Sangha, hear the sermons from the Buddha. Supya, another devout, Buddhist lady usually accompanied her during her visits. Wisaka was so generous and so serviceable to the Sangha that 
once she approached the Buddha and asked for the following eight boons. She wished to be allowed to give robes to the Sangha during the rainy season as long as she lived. To provide alms to the bhikkhus coming to Sawati was the second. Three, to provide alms for those going out from Sawati. Four, to give food for the sick bhikkhus. Five, to give food for those who attend on the sick. Six, to give medicine for the sick bhikkhus. And seven, to give rice gruel for bhikkhus. And eight, to give bathing garments for the nuns. And the Buddha granted these eight boons for her. Now, one day, Visaka happened to visit the monastery. She was decked in her best garment presented to her by her father as a dowry. But as she thought it was unseemly to see the Buddha so gaily dressed, she made a bundle of it and gave it to the slave girl and went to see the Buddha dressed in another garment given to her by her father-in-law. After the sermon, she left the monastery accompanied by the slave girl who forgot to take the bundle, which was placed in her custody. Now, Venerable Ananda saw this bundle and as instructed by the Buddha, he kept it in a safe place to be returned to the owner, Wisaka. On hearing that the bundle was inadvertently left by the maid, she asked her to bring it back unless Venerable Ananda had touched it. When what had happened was reported to Wisaka, she went to the Buddha and expressed her desire to do something beneficial with the money that was realized by selling this garment. The Buddha advised her to erect a monastery at the East Gate for the use of the Sangha. Now, this part was not really well explained because what happened was you see, the maid was sent back to get the garment, the bundle, but only if Ananda had not touched it. When she found out that Ananda had touched it, she said it must be sold. And so what happened was she held an auction to sell the garment. But remember this garment, it was actually given to her uh, as a dowry when she was wed. He was a millionaire and it was hugely expensive. No one had enough money to buy the dress. So what she did was she bought the dress. And then when she took the money from, uh, the monks had the money that was coming from the dress being sold where she bought it. She took that money and she built the monastery. So this left a little piece out here, I think. Very important to understand that part of this whole thing. As no one had the means to buy the costly garment, she herself bought it back and erected a monastery at a great cost and named it Ubarama. And invite, as invited by Wisaka, the Buddha and his disciples, they spent the Wisak period, I'm sorry, the Wasak, in this new spacious monastery. Great was Wisaka's joy when the Buddha spent six rainy seasons there. Also, when this monastery was built, it was also built like a palace, but it was not dressed out like a palace. But structurally, it was built the same as a palace. 
So there were no tapestries, paintings and furniture and such because it was to be used as a monastery. Books state that the kind of Isaka, uh, instead of chastising the slave girl for her apparent negligence, transferred her to her a share of the merit that uh, was acquired by erecting the monastery because the slave girl had given the occasion for this deed to actually happen. On various occasions, several discourses were delivered to Wisaka by the Buddha. And in one discourse, the Buddha spoke on the observance of the eight precepts by laymen on Upasatha days, which observance prevails in almost all Buddhist countries in Asia up to this day dealing with the eight qualities that make a woman seek birth in happy states. The Buddha said, active alert to cherish him always, not to make man who brings her every joy. She offers slight, not will, a good wife move to wrath her husband by some spiteful word. And she reveres all whom her Lord doth honor for she is wise, deft, nimble, up betimes. She minds his wealth amid his folk at work and sweetly orders all who need to work. A wife like this, who with her husband's wish and will complies, is born again where lovely devas dwell. In another discourse, the Buddha referring to the eight qualities in a woman that tend to wield the happiness in this world, and in the next, he spoke as follows. Here in Wisaka, a woman is capable at her work, manages the servants in her ways, and she is lovely to her Lord, and she guards his wealth. Here in Wisaka, a woman is accomplished, is truth, trustful in confidence, sadha, virtue, shila, charity, karga and wisdom panya. Being a lady of many parts, she played an important role in various activities connected with the sasana. At times she was depute, deputed uh, by the Buddha to settle disputes that arose amongst the bhikkhunis. And some vinya rules were also laid down for bhikkhus owing to her intervention and her ability to see what needed to be done. Owing to her magnanimity, she was regarded as the chief benefactress of the sasana and the greatest female supporter of the Buddha. By her dignified conduct, graceful deportment, refined manners, and courteous speech, her obedience and reverence to elders, her compassion to those who are less fortunate, her kind hospitality and religious enthusiasm, she won the hearts of all who knew her. Books will state that she had the good fortune to be the happy mother of 10 fortunate sons and 10 fortunate daughters. She died at the ripe age of 120. Just one second, I have to check one thing here. To see if I doubled down. Okay, I'm going to have to cut us off here because 
I doubled on a meeting tonight and it's very important that I go to the board meeting. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever had this happen. Jivaka is the other person who we were going to talk about. I can do this one very quickly for you because it's only two pages. But I'd like you to bring back to me any questions or write them to me to sister uh, to Kanti Kamas2 at gmail.com. Any questions that you have tonight for this session? Okay. Jivaka, the fosterling. I read this this morning and I was shocked by it, and I think it's a lovely story. Jivaka was the celebrated physician of the Buddha. Immediately after his birth, he was placed into a wooden casket and cast away by his mother, a courtesan, on a dust heap by the roadside. Prince Abeya, the son of King Bimbasara, who happened to pass that way, saw the helpless infant surrounded by crows and discovering he was still alive, Jivati, he caused him to be given to the care of the nurses. And as he was found alive, he was named Jivaka. Being adopted by a prince, he was called Kamarabacha. Growing up, he became a skillful physician and surgeon. Books state he made two successful operations on a millionaire who was suffering from a severe headache. He used to attend on the Buddha three times a day for whatever was needed. When the Buddha's foot was wounded by the splinter from the rock that was caused by hurling the rock by Devadatta, it was Jivaka who attended on him and healed his foot. Realizing the manifold advantages of having a monastery close to his residence, he erected one in his own mango park. And after the consecration ceremony of the monastery, he became a stream winner, Sotapanna. Jivaka Sutta deals with the question of eating flesh, was delivered by the Buddha to Jivaka. The basic principle behind that sutta was Shivaka was persuaded to speak to the Buddha by Devadatta to try to persuade the Buddha uh, to have all the monks be vegetarian, which was impractical. In India, it is impractical because in some areas, there's not enough vegetables grown in some parts of India. Uh, and the other point is that... Uh, in many places, wherever the monks go on alms, they cannot refuse what is given to them. And they cannot say, I'm sorry, I don't eat that. That's absolutely against Finia. And so this was part of the job, but it was uh, the most important thing that came out of the sutta was the Buddha's statement back to him after he explained his position and everything. The Buddha's position was simple. It is not important to me what a person puts into their belly to give them energy to teach the Dhamma. What is important to me is not what goes in their mouth, but what comes out of their mouth in this world that causes wars, pestilence, suffering for all humanity. So that was basically the end of the conversation. It was Javaka who induced King Ajatasattu to visit the Buddha after his parasite. He had killed both of his parents and Javaka persuaded him to go and talk to the Buddha about this. At his request, the Buddha enjoined upon his disciples to take physical exercise, such as sweeping and walking. Whereas before, there was a great deal of problems with too much sitting and too much meditation and not enough movement, which is a very dangerous situation. So I'm going to let you go. I'm going to ring the bell. I'm sorry we're doing this this way, but we have to do this because we have to be in two places at once. 
And I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> I've been trying to, but I never could figure out that one part. I kept walking, me trying to go through the wall. And every time I would do that, it was me and it was the wall and my nose. <laughs> so let's do this. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We will have more fun next week, I promise. So you bring your questions, but also write me notes. I'll, I'll answer, I promise. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.